Okay, so we saw a little bit about completeness and uh, I kind of gestured at the proof of a, of a corollary to the completeness axiom, but I left it unfinished uh, because some of it's on the homework. But uh, now I just want to tidy up here and uh, cover the last couple things in uh, section uh, four here. And then I just remember that there's still section five. So this is not actually the end of the lecture, but um, hold on. Um, but uh, yeah, we're getting there. Um, so, okay. Uh, the Archimedean property, these are just basically Archimedean property and denseness are just sort of two, two more of these kind of familiar properties that still take some justification. What's interesting about the Archimedean property is that it seems so obvious, but actually it's not true that an arbitrary ordered field has the Ar Archimedean property. There are lots of ordered fields besides Q and R, and some of them are not Archimedean. Um, the reason R is Archimedean is because of the completeness axiom. Q is also Archimedean, but for a totally different reason. So you can easily prove the Archimedean property in Q just by using the properties of fractions and integers and stuff like that. But in R, it takes a totally different argument. It uses the completeness. So that's what we're going to see. So basically, um, the statement of the Archimedean property is this. For all A and B greater than zero in R, um, there is some natural number such that um, N A is greater. Sorry, that's kind of a bad placement there. Let me just finish over here. N A is greater than B. Okay, so it seems obvious, but you actually need to invoke completeness. So I'm just going to explain the proof with a picture. Okay, I'm not going to go through the whole thing. Um, let's see, actually, let me use the straight line tool here. Okay, great. Um, so let's say uh, here's zero. And then here's a, let's say B is over here, obviously it continues. And then, um, you know, here's like 2A, 3A, all the multiples of A. Now let's kind of, they approach it by contradiction. So let's imagine that actually this sequence never exceeded B. So all of the multiples of A stay less than B. Let's suppose this insane thing happens where that's true, okay? What that means is that B is an upper bound for the set of all these multiples. So the multiples, the multiples of A would have a least upper bound by completeness. So let's call that, so this is, the um, supremum of NA for the for all multiples of A. Let's call that um, S naught, okay? Um, I'm using slightly different notation from what they do, but it's basically the same idea. So now, uh, if you look at this, this is the supremum, which means it's the least upper bound, right? Emphasis on least. So if this is the least upper bound, then if you subtract a, so let's say here's s naught minus a, right? This cannot be an upper bound for the set. This is a key way of reasoning about these things. You're going to have to keep doing this over and over again. If you take the least upper bound and subtract anything from it, you get a lower number that is no longer an upper bound. Now, what it means not to be an upper bound mean, is equivalent. So the meaning of that, right, is equivalent to saying, that there is an element of this set which is greater than this number, okay? I hope that makes sense. So to be clear, S naught minus A is not an upper bound, which means there is a multiple of A which is bigger than S naught minus A. So let's put that here. I'm gonna just call it Ka, okay? So Ka is somewhere in between S naught minus A and S naught. But now if you just add one to K, you'll get k plus 1a, which is now bigger than s naught, which is now bigger than s naught, which contradicts the assumption that s naught was an upper bound. Okay? So there you have it. That's basically the proof in a nutshell. Um, so now uh, for the denseness, 
all kind of draw a similar picture. Uh, let me state it first. So for all A, B, in R, there exists a rational number in Q such that um, A is less than R is less than B. So there's a rational number in between any two real numbers. That's what it's saying. So the way they approach this is they say, well, let's look at, um, you know, A and B and kind of consider the distance between them, right? Uh, which is B minus A in this case, since B is bigger than A. Uh, so, sorry, this should be, it's assumed that B is bigger than A. Um, let me just kind of rewrite this. So A is less than B. So uh, they look at this and then they say, there's a multiple of this, which is bigger than one, right? So they scale this up um, to the point where we have like N A and N B. Something like that and like that until this distance is bigger than one, right? And now they argue that um, because this distance is bigger than one, there has to be an integer in between somewhere, which they call M. And then they end up saying, so from that you can say, NA is less than M is less than NB, which tells you that A is less than M over N, which is less than B. And so this is your rational number. So that's all I'm really gonna say about that. There's sort of easy properties to understand. I think it can be illuminating to see the nuances of how you have to prove them in this very, this world of extreme rigor. <laughs> and uh, yeah, so that's all for this. And now uh, in the next section, I think there should only be one or two more sections here of this lecture. I'll talk about um, infinity and negative infinity, which are just these, uh, they're just symbolic uh, conveniences.